about dynamical quantum phase transitions. Yeah, so uh, thanks again for coming. Um, yesterday, um, I started the lectures by uh, uh, first motivating why uh, we want to study non-equilibrium dynamics. Then I told you a bit about the basics about these dynamical transitions relation to uh, of the central object, the Lusch with amplitude to complex partition functions. And I um, discussed already one uh, important aspect, namely that they can obey scaling and universality for uh, one particular example. Now the um, aim of the remaining parts of the lecture is to uh, more, not, not so much anymore address the question of why they uh, occur, but more uh, of what that actually means and um, why the, these non-analyticities in this, uh, uh, in, the op in this Loschmidt amplitude has uh, any significance on other observables that are those which are typically measured like local observables and correlation functions. And in particular now this um, the first part like I would, I would like to discuss today, um, which is about dynamical phase transitions in a rather um, broad class of uh, problems, namely in systems which uh, in equilibrium exhibit symmetry breaking. Um, for such kind of models, uh, we have a rather developed a rather uh, general understanding of what these dynamical transitions mean, and this is uh, what I would like to tell you in the following. Essentially, this will follow the line uh, of uh, one experiment that has been uh, performed um, in the trapped ion group in Innsbruck uh, roughly one year ago, and um, plots of which you have seen already on previous slides, and which are also in, like, in this, which you can see again here in this. Uh, uh, also on this, on this slide. Okay, so now we want to study dynamical phase transitions in models which have uh, symmetry breaking in equilibrium. Let me uh, go back one step again and um, show you uh, one of these central objects I'm discussing here all the time, which uh, I call here Loh Schmidt Eco, which uh, is uh, a probability here, so I'm not actually in the following, will not discuss the amplitude, but rather the probability of uh, the probability associated to the amplitude that uh, uh, the, or the overlap of your time evolved initial condition with the initial condition itself. And in the quantum quench protocols I am considering here, this initial condition is the ground state of some initial Hamiltonian. But now, I already told you, uh, I would like to study uh, dynamical transitions in systems with uh, symmetry breaking. And now, uh, which leads to the following question. Now, uh, what should you do now when uh, your ground state is not unique? <clears throat> when you have a degenerate ground state manifold. Um, so then, of course, this quantity is not uniquely defined anymore, and you have to think about uh, some generalization of that. And this generalization is not unique. There are different choices you can take. And as I would like to convince you in the following, uh, this, this generalization turns out to be very uh, useful. It is the full probability to return back to the ground state manifold. So the idea is the following. You suppose you have now, uh, I think the simplest case, you take a simple magnet, which has a, a doubly degenerate ground state manifold with either all spins pointing up or all spins pointing down. You choose one of your, these two symmetry broken initial conditions, as, or symmetry broken states as your initial condition, your psi naught. You time evolve your state, and then you don't uh, study just a single uh, return probability to one 
to one of these uh, uh, symmetry broken ground states, but rather uh, the full return probability, which involves the sum over all individual probabilities to return to one of these states. Okay? So, uh, why do we uh, want to study this uh, along the lines of the experiment here? Um, because in the experiment, uh, it was, they realized some long range icing model which has symmetry breaking uh, in its ground state, at least when the transfer speed is weak. So, the full Hamiltonian uh, they can implement in the experiment consists of two parts. H0 uh, denotes here our initial Hamiltonian. So, for which we uh, uh, prepare our ground state, and that H naught is some uh, icing, is some uh, classical icing model, um, but infinite of infinite range uh, type, meaning that uh, you don't you not only have an interaction between nearest neighboring spins, but uh, also very distant spins interact with each other. It's some kind of a mean field, it's a mean field type icing model. And then there's a second term, this V, this is a transverse field. And the protocol they have been implementing uh, in the experiment was like taking uh, one of the ground states initially of this uh, H naught and then suddenly switching on uh, a rather strong transverse field. So for our initial Hamiltonian here, we have precisely the, precisely the situation of a magnet so the ground state manifold is doubly degenerate, um, all spins pointing up or all spins pointing down. As I said, now like the protocol is the following. Now choo let's choose one of these symmetry broken ground states as our initial condition, the, uh, all spins pointing up here. And now we are interested in this full return probability to the ground state manifold. Um, since the ground state manifold of our initial Hamiltonian is doubly degenerate, uh, this full return pr probability consists of, uh, or is a sum over two terms. So either, uh, so where this new is either referring to the uh, polarized with plus uh, magnetization and minus magnetization, and uh, so either returning to the same, to, to your initial condition, or to the state uh, with all spins completely flipped. Now, as um, I already told you um, uh, in the last lecture, such probabilities have uh, this large deviation scaling, meaning that um, they are, uh, have this exponential dependence um, on the number of degrees of freedom n in our system. So here, uh, N just corresponds to the number, total number of spins uh, that are realized on, on the chain. Okay, so that, so, so uh, what can we now learn from that? So there's one uh, important property that I will use the following very often. So now this full return probability is the sum uh, of, uh, sum of two terms and since now, and now comes in the large deviation scaling. So both of these terms, due to this large deviation scaling, are exponentially small in, or depend exponentially on system size n. And since they do that, um, always one uh, or the other term will dominate completely the sum in the thermodynamic limit. So for example, if you choose if you have a situation where lambda up is 0 0.1 and lambda 2 is maybe 0 0.2, uh, or lambda down is 0 0.2, when you take n to be 1,000, uh, this number will be much smaller than this one. So in the thermodynamic limit, only one of these two uh, numbers will dominate. So, and this you can see here on the right-hand side, so if the lambda up uh, is smaller than lambda down, um, the uh, P of T converges just uh, to this value given by this first term. And uh, in the other case, in the reverse case where lambda down is smaller than lambda up, P 
of t will be just given by the lambda down contribution. So that's now a property of the thermodynamic limit. In the end, it means that uh, suppose you're plotting now, suppose you are able to measure uh, both of these numbers separately, and you're plotting now just these uh, individual rate functions lambda up and lambda down, as I've done here. So suppose this is your measurement of uh, this function lambda up, and this is the measurement of your function lambda down. Um, from uh, the above considerations, we know that when we consider this big P, only uh, the smaller of the two will always will have uh, will dominate in the thermodynamic limit. So it means when you observe such a crossing of these two functions, uh, only the dominant contribution is indicated here with this yellow line uh, will be this one and will lead to such a kink as you can see here. So it's very like uh, su suggestively similar to like a first order ground state phase transition in a, in a quantum um, any body system where you would only look for your uh, with for uh, for uh, the one state which minimizes your energy so here you minimize uh, accordingly your rate function so this might uh, uh, look somehow like this is constructed in such a way that uh, it has to lead to some non analytic behavior um, but the main point now of the following five to ten slides will be to uh, argue that there's a lot of physics behind that and this is not just a construction but has physical meaning. Okay, and now, um, yes please. Yes? Um, so, like, um, in, for this experiment, it's sim rather simple because um, in this trapped ion experiment, they can uh, prepare you like any kind of um, product state you would like to. So, which means that uh, they, you can program your experiment such that it will output you the uh, all spins pointing up state. So, there is no, no problem in that. Um, in general, we would always assume that. Um, um, of course, in a realistic system, if the system is large enough, we would have symmetry breaking, and we could, for example, assure that we have a, uh, that the system chooses the all spins up state by applying a magnetic field. Additionally, but here it's simpler. It's, uh, it's uh, the initial condition is uh, is in, or is initialized in a different way, such that you're um, with almost certainty uh, assured that you always get. Uh, specific spin configuration. Okay, and now um, this construction has now been used in this experiment. Um, so what uh, that I've been showing you already before. So now suppose you can measure uh, these individual uh, lambda lines. And uh, this is what you can see here in this plot, uh, essentially. So um, there are some gray data points up there which are not really uh, uh, prominent, um, but they're included to show that actually what has been measured individually are these uh, lambda, uh, lambda up uh, contribution and also the lambda down contribution. And as you can see here, uh, those two lines uh, cross. <coughs> um, now, when you, uh, by hand, take uh, just the minimum of those two curves, you will automatically, of course, get uh, this kink here. Now, we had a question already on uh, uh, yesterday, ah, but these are now rather small numbers for which they did the simulations, like for uh, six spins, eight spins, and, and ten spins, how can you deduce now non-analytic behavior? Of course, it's only possible here due to a theoretical input. So if you were to compute this full return probability for 6, 8, and 10 spins, you would, of course, uh, see that uh, this is rounded off. What has been done here, measure both of these uh, uh, rate functions individually and use the theoretical input that only the minimum contributes. And if you use that input, 
uh, and suppose these individual uh, individual uh, rate functions have almost converged for your uh, accessible system sizes, you can uh, get a rather accurate prediction in the thermodynamic limit, which is not the case over here. Here you see rather strong dependence on system size for the second kink, but for this one here, finite size dependence is already rather weak. Yeah, please. Um, you mean this remaining slight uh, system size dependence here? Uh, slightly, um, but um, this, like, you see, so the, the, uh, the dots are experimental data and the red lines are theoretical calculations. Um, from the theoretic, theoretical calculations, we know that uh, this converges uh, to something which gives you a kink in the thermodynamic limit. So from that side, we are sure, and like theory, theory also compares well to the experiment. You should be careful, as I, as I also try to emphasize, you should be careful in uh, like, what, is, what are the predictions you can make from, from this experimental data, because in order to argue about uh, non-analytic behavior, you first, you have to use a theoretical input, um, and uh, secondly, there's still some weak finite size dependence, um, which of course does not allow you to directly extrapolate to the thermodynamic limit yet for these three numbers. That's not possible. It's just consistent. But uh, maybe I can also take the chance here to make one further remark. Um, actually, I would say it's remarkable that this data, is, uh, that this data exists because you have to uh, keep in mind that those two probabilities that you measure they are exponentially small in system size. So these uh, are uh, extremely small numbers. And uh, you cannot, by principle, measure these numbers for a large system. So this is impossible. The only way uh, to measure these quantities is for a small system. And to find a way here to make at least some prediction on uh, potential non-analytic behavior in the thermodynamic limit is rather remarkable. Okay, so now, uh, again, we have, I've shown you uh, some, some further uh, uh, example where this quantity uh, becomes non-analytic, but I've never really told you what that now actually means. Uh, let me now take a pessimistic perspective initially. So, uh, this psi naught of t um, is our full time evolved wave function with a lot of information in there. And for this amplitude or for the, uh, this, this probability, return probability, we are, oops, sorry, we are always projecting onto one basis state in Hilbert space. So when you think, when you want to visualize that, uh, that a Hilbert space is a huge object and what this g of t measures is the projection of your full, full time evolved wave function onto one single dot here. So how uh, at all can this single overlap be important for understanding the dynamics of this whole object in, in Hilbert space? So how can this be? Yeah, please. You can, of course, also take a superposition of those two. Okay, like the, um, uh, I did mention that, uh, like there was a question uh, after the lecture yesterday also concerning that. Um, the, actually, everything I present to you uh, relies at the moment on uh, having a pure state. Um, the, uh, you can generalize that to mixed states, however, as for this full return probability, um, this uh, generalization is not unique, and there are many different choices you can take which are not equivalent for mixed states, which all reduce to the same, um, the same um, quantity or converge to the same thing when you uh, make your state pure again. 
So you have to make a choice, and that, uh, that case is not settled, I would say. So there are many different uh, proposals how one should generalize that. I will not cover that in my lecture here. So there are ways to do that, but it's not unique and it's not settled. Okay, so how can this single overlap be important now for understanding the dynamics of this wave function in Hilbert space? So how can this be important for any local observable? Um, essentially, the, this question boils down to the following. Is what we observe at this point, a uh, single point in Hilbert space, is this some singular behavior? Or do these, the properties we observe at this point, are they continuously connected to a larger por portion of Hilbert space? So is the influence of, of this single overlap sp spreading over uh, larger portions of Hilbert space or not? Uh, or can, that, can this uh, spreading uh, occur at all? Um, not clear beforehand, probably. Um, fortunately, there is, there is one... Uh, one example you all, uh, many of you probably know well, where such a, such a situation happens in equilibrium. And that is for a quantum phase transition. A quantum phase transition is a transition which only happens uh, in the ground state of a quantum anybody system. So here you can see uh, a plot of uh, illustrating the properties of some system exhibiting a, a quantum phase transition. So you see temperature and some external control parameter, G. Uh, the quantum phase transition occurs at zero temperature in the ground state that uh, corresponds to temperature, the temperature zero axis. So it occurs down here. But uh, now one could say, ah, you, in an experiment you can never reach zero temperature by the third law of thermodynamics. It's impossible. So how can a quantum phase transition be relevant at all? Uh, than if you cannot uh, observe it in experiment. The reason is that the influence of, of your, of, or the properties of this, that you can see at your, for the single state, the ground state, spread to uh, larger portions of Hilbert space. So there is a quantum critical region in the temperature control parameter plane where the properties of of your system are still controlled by this underlying quantum critical point. So the influence is spreading, although the uh, quantum phase transition only occurs in one state, namely the ground state. And that's what I would like to co convince you now in the following, and that also justifies uh, the notion of a dynamical quantum phase transition, that uh, this kind of transition is uh, not so to which, like, to some extent at least, an analog of a quantum phase transition in the dynamical regime. And upon re doing the following replacements, I will go in uh, de more detail later on. So of course there's no temperature in our uh, dynamical setup. I told you rather in the beginning, the states we consider don't have a thermodynamic description. There's no thermodynamic, there's no free energy, so there's no temperature. But we can think about energy densities. And instead of a control parameter, of course, we have time because those transitions occur as a function of time. So instead of thinking in terms of a temperature control parameter plane, you should think of an energy density time plane. So why does it make overall sense to do that? Uh, actually, uh, because of the following in that I'm mostly repeating what I said already. So what this amplitude is doing, it's projecting the time-evolved state onto the initial condition. The initial condition, however, was a ground state of some Hamiltonian, okay? So if you think now uh, measuring uh, en energy with your initial Hamiltonian, um, what these dynamical transitions tell you is when you uh, in this energy density time plane, these dynamical transitions tell you what happens down on this line. And now, what is the main question? Whether there exists some analog of a critical region, indicated here in, as this uh, white area, that uh, uh, 
where the properties are still controlled by this underlying dynamical quantum phase transitions. I will now make this mu much more concrete. Yes, please. Um, so, probably the best thing is like, let, let me go uh, further two slides, then you will, uh, will, exp will explain that in detail. But it's a uh, subtle point. Yeah. Yes? Um, good question. I don't know, like, I don't know, but I'm thinking about it, but I don't know yet. I don't want to make any definite statement about it. Please. So you mean uh, you mean these crossover lines? Um, what, how you should think about the crossover lines here? Um, so I don't like. That's why I didn't put like the word in quantum critical region here because we don't know yet whether we can actually have. Uh, so we are working on that. We were not yet. We are not yet 100% sure whether we can have really scaling in this region, or whether there is just uh, uh, some other kind of influence of this point up here. So, like the uh, the precise, like the uh, or when you go to the equilibrium case to the quantum critical region, these crossover lines or the how they look like. This depends. Uh, so. Uh, crucially on the uh, critical exponents of the underlying quantum phase transition, um, whether something like this holds for, uh, in, in this case, we cannot, we cannot say yet. Okay, okay so now, um, um, here you can actually already see like an actual measurement of what I would like now to discuss of this analog of this quantum, crit uh, quantum critical region. And this has been done now again in this uh, trapped ion experiment where they, uh, for this data set, realized a slightly different Hamiltonian. So it was not a infinite range Hamiltonian where all spins uh, were uh, interacting equally with each other, but you had some algebraic, uh, there is some algebraic dis uh, dependence on, on, the, uh, on the distance of the two, uh, on the two spins. However, this is uh, not important at all for the, for the general picture. I've just written it down mainly um, to uh, point out the following. So now, um, suppose you're interested now uh, in the dynamics of the order parameter of the magnetization. So initially, we were preparing uh, our state in our system in the fully polarized state where this uh, order parameter is one. And suppose now we want to monitor that uh, the dynamics of the order parameter now upon switching on the transverse field. For uh, this particular uh, initial um, Hamiltonian that we were choosing, which, is, uh, which includes only um, the spin-spin uh, coupling, um, we, have, uh, we have that uh, the order parameter actually commutes with that operator. Of course, that's a fine-tuned point, and we are currently working on the generalization of that. But for simplicity, uh, let's uh, consider uh, that case. So now, because these two operators commute, you can measure them simultaneously. And that is actually what has been done in the experiment. The experiment has done a projective measurement on energy, measuring the energy, and afterwards measuring the magnetization of that state. And that's possible because those two operators commute. Now, on a more formal level, it means, so when you have two commuting observables and you can measure them simultaneously, you can, um, uh, there exists a joint probability distribution for, uh, like, when you fix some time, t here, um, there is a probability distribution um, that your state has energy E and some magnetization density, I call it here, M, okay? Um, for 
since energy is also an, is an extensive quantity, I will in the following work also with the energy density, uh, which is an intensive quantity. And from this joint probability distribution of energy density or energy and magnetization density, you can compute also your order parameter. So your order parameter is nothing else th than this integral. So integrating over uh, energy density, magnetization density, here is the magnetization density and the corresponding probability distribution. Okay? But that's only possible because the, uh, you can measure those two quantities uh, simultaneously. <coughs> so well, what I will now tell you is the, uh, to, is, is the part which also took me the most time to, to digest myself. So, uh, so uh, uh, don't be uh, worried if, uh, if it takes a bit of time to, to digest this. Yeah, please. Yes, so that's the system. Yes, so like we are doing the time evolution up to some time t, and then with that state at that time t, we are now doing a series of measurements. So f we first measure the energy with, with our initial Hamiltonian. So doing that projective measurement gives you in the end uh, an energy, and uh, your system is afterwards in the corresponding eigenstate. Yes, in the end, it's just a sigma z measurement of all, spin, of all the spins in, in the chain, yes. And from which you can compute then the magnetization and the energy. Yes, so V is somehow the perturbation, but it is strong here. It's not a weak one. Yes? Whether integrability plays a role here, you mean? Oh. Um, so, no, a long time limit is something which is, especially when you think about adding perturbations, is something highly non trivial where I cannot give you any definite answer to that. This phenomenon I'm discussing here happens on short to intermediate times. And for that, um, there are many studies which hint towards the fact that weak perturbations on these short to intermediate time scales don't play uh, a crucial role. But long time limit uh, is a completely different aspect and also much, much, more, chal much more challenging to study. Okay. Coming back here, so the fact that we have this joint probability distribution allows us to express our, like the mean value of the magnetization during dynamics. By the way, this is the one which is uh, plotted here, so over time, this one here, is given by uh, this expression, okay? Now, since both energy density and the magnetization density uh, are related to extensive variables, there is a, a central limit theorem for uh, the probability distribution. Essentially, it's very sharply peaked around mean values. So this allows us, for example, in the, at least in the thermodynamic limit, um, to perform the integration over the magnetization density. Um, Analytically, because we, uh, this p is just a delta function at some mean value of the magnetization. So why I'm doing that? I'm doing that only uh, to show you that the full magnetization, you can decompose spectrally as an integral over energy density involving the probability uh, to be at that respective energy density and the corresponding magnetization at that energy density, okay? Practically in the experiment, what you would do is uh, to 
get this object, so that is now the main object we are interested in, to get this object, you would uh, measure an energy density. You would uh, perform a projective measurement giving you some energy density, epsilon, and then you measure the corresponding magnetization at that given energy density. And that is this quantity. Formally, you can uh, derive it in that way, but you can also think in simpler terms of this uh, projective uh, measurement. Furthermore, we can go one step, uh, we can do one step more. Um, there's also a central limit theorem for, for this probability distribution in that it is sharply peaked uh, only at its mean value. That's what I denote by epsilon average. So that the overall magnetization is this energy resolved one um, given just uh, at the mean value of the energy density, okay? And that mean value of the energy, so like, um, now let me go to the actual experimental uh, data here. So what you can see here is uh, a color plot. Uh, on this axis is the energy density normalized uh, such that uh, the full spectrum goes from zero to one. Uh, this is time, and the color scale is this energy resolved magnetization at a given time t. In the upper plot, you see uh, a measurement of, the, of this full return probability indicating uh, a dynamical quantum phase transition at this point and at this point here. This uh, red line here, this red line is the, is, uh, is the dynamics of this uh, mean energy density. So that is the value of the energy density which is relevant for local observables. Okay? Because uh, the uh, mean value of this local uh, observable is only determinant from what happens at this mean energy density. Okay, so now let's try to interpret uh, uh, this plot in, in more detail. So at zero energy density, as I pointed out, that's uh, where the dynamics is uh, controlled completely by these dynamical quantum phase transitions. Because the, the low Schmidt uh, uh, or the full return probability lives down there. So now we have here at these points, uh, remember back a few slides, the origin of these kings that you see here is that these two rate functions cross. It means that at this point you have a switching between uh, a dominating probability for all spins pointing up to a, a dominating probability of all spins pointing down. If you do now the sequence of two measurements, project first to your ground state manifold and afterwards measure the magnetization. If you would do that in the thermodynamic limit, what you would observe is along this line, initially you would always measure plus one for the magnetization because the, with almost certainty you are still in the up state in your ground state manifold. And at the point where your dynamical transition occurs, you suddenly uh, jump um, to minus one because the probability of uh, all spins pointing down completely overcomes. That's now to dominate. At the next dynamical transition, you will find the complete opposite switching from minus one to one. So along this axis down here, actually you find a non-analytic behavior of this, um, of this M star uh, of T in the thermodynamic limit, plus one, jump to minus one, down here it's always minus one, plus one, and consistent here with this uh, color scale that you see. But as you can also see is that uh, this jump which occurs down here is actually uh, does not represent a singular point, as I was trying to argue before. The influence of that jump 
extends to non-zero energy densities. Okay? You see that uh, maybe this, uh, the crossover from a positive to a negative magnetization is smoothed out. Um, still, uh, the un you see a region uh, in between where the magnetization always has to be zero. And that one could interpret here now as like this a dynamical analog to a critical region, which extends up to the mean energy density up here, which is then uh, uh, controlling the, the magnetization. So give you, let me give you a, another um, um, physical argument. What this dynamical transition in this model tells you is that this is the point, so initially, in your initial condition, it was chosen as all spins pointing uh, in uh, up direction. This initial condition explicitly breaks the Z2 symmetry that uh, the transverse field icing model has. From the analysis of the full return probability to, to the ground state manifold, the point of this non-analytic behavior is precisely the point where the system is able to restore the Z2 symmetry because the probability of up and down becomes the same. In terms of the magnetization, which is the order parameter which measures how, to which extent you have uh, broken the Z2 symmetry, has to become zero, and that's what you observe here. So the zero of the magnetization here is somehow a remnant of the underlying dynamical phase transition. In other words, if you observe now in these models a sequence of dynamical transitions as here, uh, you can conclude that your, uh, that your order parameter shows some oscillatory decay. And there's actually a vast literature in the non-equilibrium dynamics context discussing precisely uh, this aspect of that um, uh, there are very often parameter regimes of the dynamics where the order parameter decays in an oscillatory fashion. Uh, this allows you, I know this takes some time to digest uh, all these uh, line of arguments, but these line of arguments tell you that uh, you can trace, the back, can trace this back to an underlying dynamical transition, which are those points in time where you, the system is capable to restore the set 2 symmetry which you have initially broken. Okay, so Questions to that one here? Yeah, please. No, the magnetization, um, I'm almost sure like a local observable or some correlation function can never exhibit in, in dynamics, can never exhibit uh, non-analytic behavior. Probably just to uh, principles such as causality and locality. I think it's not possible. So those quantities are always smooth. Um, but it does not, like in analogy to, the, to a quantum phase transition, it does not mean that, they're not, uh, that their behavior is disconnected from what happened, from something which, uh, <coughs> which is disconnected from these dynamical transitions. But those, I'm almost sure, magnetizations, correlation functions, they will always be uh, analytic functions. Like measurable quantities are analytic. Uh, like for a quantum phase transition in equilibrium, any susceptibility will always be analytic when you, uh, uh, when you measure it. Suppose you don't have a finite temperature phase transition. transition. Any susceptibility will be uh, always analytic. Only upon cooling to zero temperature, you would get true analytic behavior. Here, the analogy would be some post-selection procedure. So when you were able to post-select your energy density such that you cool your system effectively down to your ground state manifold, then you can see non-analytic behavior. But as long as you are, are at some finite energy density, finite temperature, everything is smooth. Yeah, please. Yes. Yes, yes, there the origin is of this non-analytic behavior is completely different. Um, and that's actually the case we are currently analyzing with a, a PhD student. Um, the problem you have there is that 
you don't satisfy this condition. So you cannot measure these two quantities in the same way. So you have to use a completely different framework to draw a similar analogy. And this is what we are developing right now. Yes, and like what we, we uh, observe a similar behavior like, like, like we have here, but it's not, this work is not finished. Okay, further questions concerning this part, yes? To, to you, to, sorry, to do what? To use which kind of propagator? Sorry, I didn't hear. Ah, you mean whether one could think about different kind of uh, operators, like not just unitary evolution, but something different, like? Hmm? Ah, you mean the Fourier transform of that, essentially. So you mean essentially looking at the Fourier transform of that object. Um, this question came up in some different context yesterday, like um, <clears throat> uh, the Fourier transform of this uh, Loschmidt uh, amplitude is uh, an energy distribution function or work distribution function. We were trying to see signatures, but they are somehow hidden in that quantity. So like there's n uh, at least there's nothing spectacular immediately visible when you look at these quantities. Of course, the non-analytic behavior in time, when you do a Fourier transform, there has to be something in that, the Fourier transform, some property of the Fourier transformed quantity, um, uh, some special structure, but it's uh, only hardly visible. It's not very prominent. Okay, so like, um, it, I know that to understand the details that, uh, that takes a while, maybe just as a take home message here, that is an example where um, you can take, uh, um, where you can connect your, um, uh, the, these dynamical quantum phase transition or the influence of these dynamical quantum phase uh, transitions to the dynamics of a local observable for a rather general class of, uh, of problems. Um, and this goes via some analog of a uh, critical region. And even that critical region, to some extent, has been measured in this trapped ion experiment. OK, now let's go to uh, a bit uh, simpler things. Let me maybe just point out one further, uh, uh, I think, interesting aspect of this, of this experiment. And uh, namely, what they also did, they measured uh, the en uh, entanglement dynamics also of this in this quantum spin chain. You see two different quantities. So this is both done for a, a six-side chain. Um, here on the entanglement, half-chain entanglement entropy S, and here a, a, the Kita, so-called uh, Kitagawa Ueda spin squeezing parameter. Um, let me first uh, discuss a bit uh, the uh, uh, entanglement entropy. So both uh, entanglement entropy. So you see here a time rescaled in, in some units in such a way that one corresponds to the occurrence of the first of the dynamical phase, trans dynamical phase uh, transitions observed, and three to the value the second uh, of these two kings were seen in the experiment. And um, as you can see overall, the entanglement entropy, so initially it uh, should be actually exactly zero because uh, in the perfect world, the initial conditions should be a fully polarized state. This is a product state, should not have any uh, entanglement. So that is then uh, what this red, red line, the theory uh, curve of course, uh, gives you. The uh, black dots are the actual uh, measured data you see that there is some overall offset, and uh, that overall offset can actually be explained rather simply by 
um, by the fact that the initial condition was not a perfectly polarized state, but uh, like the, uh, the spins were maybe slightly tilted away from the, from the North Pole. And this is then uh, the, the blue line, so in incorporating this slight changes of slight deviation from the initial condition. The blue line is the corresponding theoretical prediction for the for uh, a simulation for that case, and it rather uh, matches rather nicely to the experimental data. Okay, so now initially uh, entanglement is weak, and as we all uh, in general believe, when we do um, and dynamics, non-equilibrium dynamics in a, a quantum anybody system, the entanglement entropy is entropy when we're not dealing with, uh, or with systems that are uh, disordered or um, of many body localized nature, that the entanglement entropy is supposed to increase linearly. But actually when you look, look here, this, there is maybe an overall linear growth when you do it on theory, like it goes on and on uh, in this way. Um, but there's a substructure to that, so that the uh, um, entanglement entropy shows its actual growth in the vicinity of this dynamical quantum phase transition, leveling off in between, and then starting to increase again in the vicinity of these dynamical transitions. The same thing you see uh, for this Kitagawa spin squeezing parameter. You can focus here on this red curve. Um, smaller value of, of this number means that uh, the system is more squeezed, has more en entanglement uh, into it. Again, you see that, uh, that there is, a, in the vicinity of these, uh, of these lines, that you see a rather sharp um, drop of that quantity. So indicating that the entanglement production in this, uh, in, in, uh, in this model is str uh, strongly connected to these dynamical transitions, and you can actually understand this because the, this long-range icing model that they realize is actually uh, used for spin squeezing. Um, and uh, although in a different parameter regime, but in uh, uh, recognizing that connection, you can actually uh, understand why at least spin squeezing should occur only <clears throat> in the vicinity of these dynamical transitions. So there is also a connection uh, uh, between these dynamical transitions and um, entanglement production in this model. Okay, so that was the hard part of the lecture. Um, so in the following, um, I see now my time is uh, uh, almost over for uh, this part of the lecture. Um, in the following, I would now like to discuss uh, such transitions in uh, topological uh, systems. I will not, uh, so I will probably uh, stop here um, before continuing. Let me just say maybe uh, two or three more words. Um, so this has turned out to be a uh, very interesting application of this concept of dynamic uh, transitions. On the one hand, you can uh, uh, make rather, uh, or, uh, rather, um, um, well analytical, can develop a rather well analytical understanding. And also for this type of uh, systems, we uh, have a rather generic way of also uh, constructing order parameters for these dynamical transitions, which I've not shown you before. And I will also show you a few experiments that have in the meantime measured these uh, order parameters for uh, in, such, in such systems. And with that, um, I would say I would stop and let's go for lunch. Thank you.